Great. Hello. Uh, it's Mike Salter here from uh, Toronto, uh, slightly rainy and cold Toronto. We're looking forward to uh, the coming of spring to Canada. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to be part of this uh, webinar and uh, to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we've been working on in my lab over the last uh, number of years related to NMDA receptor function uh, and how that may be related specifically to various disease processes and some aspects of normal uh, brain function. So I'm going to divide the talk into three different parts. Uh, first, I'll tell you a little bit about what we've been working on in terms of the molecular events that regulate NMDA receptor function, at least in the context in which we work. Uh, then I'll tell you a little bit about more specifically about uh, regulation uh, in uh, a form of synaptic plasticity known as long-term potentiation and a little bit about what we've been doing there and how we think that may relate to some uh, brain plasticity uh, deficits. And then in the end, uh, I'm sort of an emerging idea that we've been working on together with John McDonald's lab here in Toronto about how sarcomely kinases may regulate uh, metaplasticity through differentially regulating different subtypes of NMDA receptors. So I appreciate that uh, some of you uh, may not be neurobiologists. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is the fundamental unit of synaptic transmission, at least excitatory synaptic transmission, uh, which is pervasive in the mammalian central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. And what you can see in this diagram is uh, just a cartoon that illustrates the way we think about synaptic transmission at these fast excitatory uh, synapses. So there are uh, presynaptic elements which release glutamate in little vesicles, and that glutamate then is able to diffuse across a very narrow synaptic cleft and interact with two sets of strategically localized types of receptors. Those are the AMPA receptors and the NMDA receptors. And the focus of what, what I'm going to talk about is on NMDA receptors. So what you can see here in this part is related to what you would observe if you were recording synaptic currents. So this downward deflection here is related to the opening of AMPA channels, which come on very rapidly after uh, transmitter is released, glutamate is released, and then sh uh, shut very quickly. NMDA receptors, on the other hand, come up, uh, open a little bit more slowly and stay open in a much more prolonged fashion. So you can see that a little bit better down here. You can see the NMDA receptor mediated component of the synaptic current out here in yellow. And it, I think it's probably readily apparent to you that with these sort of uh, timing differences on the orders of uh, a few milliseconds to maybe a few hundreds of milliseconds, that the information encoding uh, through NMDA receptors and AMPA receptors is quite different. And I think it's generally thought in the field that uh, NMDA receptors and AMPA receptors subserve slightly different functions in the mammalian central nervous system. AMPA receptors are involved in fast synaptic transmission at most synapses, excitatory synapses, whereas NMDA receptors uh, are involved in synaptic transmission at some synapses uh, on an ongoing basis, but mostly they're uh, involved in synaptic plasticity or the modulation of synaptic efficacy. So this is just to give you an idea of sort of what I think of as an electrophysiologist x-ray crystallographic view of the NMDA receptor. The receptor is a multi-protein complex, uh, which at the core is a non-selective cation channel. And what you can see there is that NMDA receptors are permeable to small monovalent cations like sodium and potassium. And they're well known to be permeable to, uh, to divalent cations, in particular calcium. One of the things that you may know about NMDA receptors is that they have a permeability, a weak permeability to magnesium. And the, probably the way that you know that is that the channels are blocked by magnesium. So when magnesium comes into the channel and enters the channel four, then from the outside, it uh, binds to a, a site where it essentially gets stuck. So even though magnesium can permeate the channel, it essentially gets stuck there and blocks the flow of sodium and potassium. And this is the, the molecular basis for the so-called um, voltage-dependent blockade of NMDA receptors. So at hyperpolarizing membrane potentials, that's membrane potentials where the cell, cells in the central nervous system normally find themselves in the range of minus 60 to minus 70 millivolts resting membrane potential, the magnesium is blocking the channel. But when the cells depolarize uh, during high-frequency uh, trains and, and synaptic currents, uh, then the Magnesium is repelled or is unblocked, and uh, that allows sodium, potassium, and particular calcium to flow through the channel. 
So one thing that you need to remember about these channels, if you don't already know, is that these channels are unique in amongst ligand-gated ion channels in that they are co-receptors. They bind both glutamate, hence the, the name of them being members of the glutamate receptor family, but they also bind glycine, and that's shown over here. So in fact, the holo uh, receptor complex is made up of four different uh, agonist binding subunits, two for glycine and two for glutamate. Uh, what you can also see here, and something that I think most of us have come to appreciate over the last uh, decade or so, is that the channels are not simply the ion permeation subunits, but there are a, a number of different types of intracellular proteins and transmembrane proteins, which you don't see here, but intracellular proteins that are associated with the functioning of the channel. And that's what my lab's been working on, is how protein-protein interactions and proteins in the intracellular uh, domain of the channels, how do those regulate the function of NMDA receptors? And so you can think about this in two ways. We think about, uh, for example, the basal flow of current through the channels. And what we discovered a number of years ago, and I'll show you a little bit more as we go along, is that upon phosphorylation by, and specifically by SARC family kinases or SARC itself, then there's phosphorylation of sites and proteins within the channel pore uh, within the intracellular domains of the channel that allow the uh, increased open probability, and I'll show you an example of that as we go along, which increases the current flow through the, uh, through the net uh, of all the ion channels. So one thing that uh, you can see up here is that the channels are made of, as I mentioned, two different types of subunits, four altogether. Uh, the glycine binding subunits are the so-called GLUN1 subunits, and they come in eight different splice variants. And the, the glutamate binding subunits are the so-called gluin 2 subunits, and they come in four different flavors, A, B, C, and D. And so in particular, in the mammalian central nervous system, then the two predominant subtypes of gluin 2 receptors are the gluin 2 a and gluin 2 b And so you want to keep that in mind that these are the glutamate binding subunits, because I'm going to come back and tell you more about that at the end of the talk. Okay, so this is just an example from recordings that... Uh, we did in my lab um, almost two decades ago now to give you a flavor of the kinds of experiments we do to try to determine whether the channels are regulated, for example, by protein phosphorylation or, or other uh, signaling processes. So what you see up at the top is a, a series of traces made from, in this case, from hippocampal neurons that were uh, recorded in primary culture. And the downward deflection here comes about by the application, a very brief application of, in this case, aspartate, one could use NMDA as well, aspartate to open the channels that are on this hippocampal neuron. And the downward deflection then represents the current that's generated by opening of the channels. And what you can see is that over time, one, five, 10, 15, 20 minutes, the channel, the current generated by the same application of aspartate gets bigger and bigger. And the reason for that is that during this recording, we allowed a protein tyrosine kinase catalytic domain, like I mentioned here, to enter the channel through a, a patch clamp pipette. So the concentration of the kinase catalytic domain went up and up over time, and correspondingly, the, ch the currents got bigger and bigger and bigger, as you can see here. In another experiment from another cell, uh, also a hippocampal neuron, instead of putting a protein tyrosine kinase catalytic domain into the cell, we put a protein tyrosine phosphatase catalytic domain. And in this cell, you see the current at the beginning is this big. And over time, the current gets smaller, smaller, and smaller, um, indi uh, indicating that the phosphatase had entered the channel. So we can play these games back and forth in this way, adding ki kinase catalytic domains or activators of kinases, in particular, um, Sark family kinases, then the current NMDA currents got bigger and the phosphatase uh, or uh, adding phosphatase uh, or activators of phosphatase made the currents get smaller. Now for the rest of the talk you need to know a little bit about uh, the tyrosine kinase SARC and SARC family kinase members uh, so you can understand the reagents and the uh, experimental approaches that we took in, in the latter parts of the talk. So this is just a schematic cartoon that Lorraine Kelly and I put it together a few years ago, and it shows you the major domains of Sark family kinases. So the one domain that's very well known and well conserved is the, the catalytic domain or the so-called SH1 domain. And then uh, a couple other domains that are very well known are the SH2 domain, which binds phosphotyrosine, and the SH3 domain, which binds um, 
proline-rich sequences. So within the SART family of kinases, then there are nine members of that family, and the catalytic domain, the SH2 domain, the SH3 domain, and also the so-called SH4 domain out here near the membrane are all highly conserved. Where the kinases different, differ uh, dramatically is in the primary sequence of the unique domain. Okay? So the cartoon shows you two different conformations of the channel, or of the kinase. One in which the kinase is more or less open on the right, and then a closed conformation of the kinase where there's binding of tyrosine phosphorylated uh, residue here at the C terminus, uh, in this case, based on the chick numbering, which is tyrosine 527, uh, phosphorylation of that binds intramolecularly to the SH2 domain. That puts the kinase in a closed conformation there's also an interaction between the SH3 domain and a cryptic SH3 binding uh, site uh, in another part of the kinase. And that, those two binding events really lock the kinase in a catalytically inactive form. So the kinase can be moved back and forth through a catalytic form and a non-catalytic form, uh, in large part by phosphorylation or dephosphorylation of this C-terminal uh, phosphorylation site here. So there's a specific kinase that's involved in putting the phosphate on there, that's CSK. And there's also a specific phosphatase that's involved in removing that uh, phosphate, which is our receptor PTP alpha or PTP alpha. So I'm going to come back to those as we go along. One thing that one can do, and using a phosphopeptide mimetic that was invented by Tommy Parsons' lab many years ago now, is that one can use this sequence, which I'm going to call the PYEI peptide that this SARC kinase activating peptide, which binds to the SH2 domain here and prevents the binding or reverses the binding of the phosphotyrosine. So this is a competitive interaction. So when the PYEI peptide binds, and it binds with very high affinity, binds to the SH2 domain, this flips the kinase into the active conformation. Okay? So that's one reagent that I'm going to show you that we've used quite extensively in my lab and a number of other labs to activate SARC family kinases. On the other hand, I mentioned a couple minutes ago that the SARC family of kinases diverge extensively in the so-called unique domain. And a peptide that we've used that is unique for SARC and differentiates SARC from all other members of the SARC family of kinases is this peptide, which is a fragment of a region in the unique domain called SARC 40 to 50. So this, in the context of um, the NMDA receptors, then, this is a functional inhibitor of the interaction between SARC and its target pro some of its target proteins in the NMDA receptor complex. So one thing to keep in mind is that this peptide is not a catalytic domain inhibitor, so it's not like the reagents that you may know about which inhibit the catalytic domain. Some of those are PP2 or SU5658. The, this is a, a peptide that inhibits protein-protein interactions. So those two reagents uh, that I'll show you extensively one is the PYEI peptide, the activator, SARC family kinase activator, and this one, which I'll call SARC 40 to 58, is an inhibitor in the context of the NMDA receptor complex, but not in necessarily in other contexts. Okay. So with those reagents, then we did experiments like this. So this is slightly different than the last one I showed you. Here we're recording spontaneously occurring miniature excitatory postsynaptic currents that come from uh, the spontaneous release of glutamate. Those come sporadically, and this is again from cultured hippocampal neurons. And what you can see here is the AMPA, this bi-channel uh, component of the excitatory postsynaptic currents. The first part mediated by opening of AMPA channels, and then this later part uh, by opening of NMDA receptors. And in this cell, then what we did was we infused into the cell through the patch electrode like this, this uh, PYEI peptide. And what we found was that over time, the NMDA component of the current got bigger and bigger. Uh, this we proved was NMDA receptor mediated because it was blocked by the competitive blocker aminophosphonal valeric acid. Whereas in this case, under the recording circumstances that we use, the AMPA component did not change. Right? And so you can see the NMDA receptor current here getting bigger as compared with over here. So this was the kind of evidence that we used in terms of identifying SARC family kinases or SARC itself in being involved in regulating NMDA receptor function. So we can do this kind of recording in a number of different ways. In this case, 
uh, we used a small patch of membrane in which we trapped an NMDA receptor and activated with NMDA receptor plus glycine, shown up here. And in this case, we, did, we made the patch recording in such a way that the intracellular side of the patch was on the outside, or the intracellular side of the membrane was on the outside of the patch so that we could apply reagents to the patch for example, the PYEI peptide shown here. And we made many different kinds of measurements here, but the, probably the simplest one is to understand is the, simply the open probability of the, the channel. And that's plotted uh, here over time. And in this case, then we infused onto the intracellular part, this PYEI peptide. And what we found was the open probability increased progressively over time. In another patch, uh, what we did was instead of using the PYEI peptide, we used that SARC uh, 40 to 58 uh, inhibitor peptide. And what we found is that channel function in this other patch went down. So we could play this game back and forth using either activators or inhibitors of kinases and phosphatases. And the upshot of all that is represented in this cartoon. So the way we envisage it is that NMDA receptors are controlled by a battle. And the battle is between SARC kinase itself, shown here, and a phosphatase, which I haven't told you anything about yet, called striatal enriched phosphatase, discovered by Paul Lombroso many years ago. And SARC and STEP battle it out to control the function of NMDA channels. An important point is that the, uh, that the phosphorylated channel activity is much higher than the non-phosphorylated uh, channel. But as you can see here, as I've tried to represent down here, the most dephosphorylated state of the channel that we can get, we still find channel activity. So channel uh, phosphorylation is not required for opening of the channels, but rather for enhancing channel function. And so if you can think of different situations, uh, if SARC is dominant, then channel activity goes up, whereas if STEP becomes dominant, then channel activity goes down, as you can see represented in the cartoon, <clears throat> and also in some example traces down here at the bottom. Okay, so this is the basic paradigm that we've been working under for a number of years now in terms of trying to understand what this regulation of channel function, NMDA channel function, by SARC and STEP means in the real world. So we've looked at this in a number of contexts, and I'm going to show you a couple of cartoons just related to one area that we've looked. I, I at some level, am a, am a pain biologist interested in neuroplasticity in pain, and Part of that neuroplasticity is importantly regulated by NMDA receptors. And what we discovered with Shujun Liu in my lab a number of years ago is that the interaction of SARC with the NMDA channel complex, which we had determined is mediated by this anchoring protein, MD2, that that interaction is critically important for phosphorylation of NMDA channels and producing what we call pain hypersensitivity, exaggerated pain responses that come about as a result of a number of different kinds of injuries in the periphery. One of those might be tissue damage by trauma, inflammation, or injury to peripheral nerves. So all of these kinds of tissue damage then converge on activating SARC, and this SARC activation actually occurs in neurons in what you would call the pain pathway in the pain integrative network region in the spinal cord dorsal horn. So there's a sensory processing area in the spinal cord dorsal horn and through inputs that come in from peripheral tissue, then there's activation of SARC by pathways that we're still uh, working out, but SARC kinase gets activated and causes phosphorylation of NMDA receptors and then that mediates exaggerated and pathological pain responses. So we've used what, we're, what I call here the unique domain peptide or the SARC 40 to 58 peptide in a version that we made membrane permeable. So we could give that either systemically or locally at the spinal level. So this unique domain peptide then uncouples SARC, as I told you about a couple of times now, by its interaction with the unique domain and a binding site here on the anchoring protein MD2. So this unique domain peptide then uncouples the kinase from the receptor and then allows STEP, which you don't see in this picture, STEP to dephosphorylate the channel and then reverse pain hypersensitivity. So there's a whole series of experiments we did back and forth using electrophysiology, behavior, and biochemistry to sort of validate this model. So that's one context in which we think this regulation of NMDA receptor function by the battle between SARC and STEP is extremely important. In this case, SARC wins the battle 
and causes being hypersensitive. Another area where we've uh, done work on SARC regulation of NAD receptors is in the phenomenon of long-term potentiation. So many of you will be familiar with this idea, this phenomenology, which is, has been most extensively studied at this synapse here between Schaefer collaterals of CA3 neurons synapsing on to CA1 neurons in the hippocampus. So th at these synapses, there's an NMDA, it's well known that there's an NMDA receptor mediated form of long-term potentiation. And there's a number of different kinds of stimuli, which when delivered, for example here, can enhance synaptic efficacy, which means that the strength of synaptic connections, which are plotted along here, so this is the basal synaptic efficacy. And at this point, a uh, conditioning stimulus, for example, uh, 100 hertz, tetanus or um, beta burst stimulation is delivered very briefly for a period of a few seconds or less and that produces a long-lasting facilitation or potentiation of MD, uh, AMPA current. So this is potentiation of AMPA mediated synaptic transmission and what's been known is that NMDA receptors are absolutely critical for this so that this uh, Schaefer collateral CA1 synapse is prototypical for the uh, NMDA receptor dependent form of long-term potentiation. So when I, we're talking about long-term potentiation for the rest of the talk, this is what we're talking about. NMDA receptor dependent synaptic plasticity at Schaefer collateral CA1 synapses. So a number of years ago, many years ago now actually, uh, Yuming Liu, when he was a postdoc in my lab and together with uh, John Roeder then, uh, produced a body of evidence, some of which is shown here, to indicate that SARC upregulation of NMDA receptors is critically important for the induction of long-term potentiation. So I'll just take you through this slide briefly. So over on the left side here, what you see is experiments where Yu Ming was recording using patch clamp electrodes from uh, uh, CA1 neurons. And in some neurons, like this one here, he infused into the neuron uh, the SARC inhibitor peptide in other neurons, he used a scrambled sequence of the SARC peptide, which we knew did not inhibit SARC in the context of the NMDA receptor. In particular, this scrambled peptide does not inhibit the interaction between SARC and the anchoring protein MD2. So in neurons where he used the, this control peptide, there was potentiation after, in this case, this was 100 hertz stimulation here. So 100 hertz uh, tetanic stimulation produced this potentiation and was unaffected by the scrambled SARC peptide, but this uh, potentiation was completely inhibited by the SARC uh, inhibitor peptide, which you can see here. So this is one example cell here. These are field recordings just to show that we actually delivered the stimuli. And here and in, oops, down here, and in the group data is shown here. On the other hand, we used a number of different reagents. We used another one shown here, which is a function blocking anti SARC antibody that had been developed by John Brugge's lab, which we used over here. It, the reason that we used the SARC 40 to 58 inhibitor uh, peptide was that this was, in fact, the antigenic peptide that John Brugge's lab had used to generate this SARC inhibitor uh, antibody. So, again, with the SARC inhibitor antibody, there was no long term potentiation in cells that uh, were you mean infused that antibody in, but in cells where he infused a control, nonspecific IgG, then there was uh, LTP just normal. And again, this is the group data, and this is just the field recordings from the same recording, uh, field potentials from the same recordings, just to show you that we actually delivered the tetanic stimulation. And in cells in which there was no uh, peptide or antibody infused, that there was still long-term potentiation. So this was part of the evidence that led us to this model which we've refined a little bit over the years as uh, our lab and other labs have uh, sort of fleshed out many of the details. So on the left, what you can see is the idea of basal synaptic transmission. So in the hippocampus, in at least in brain slices then, NMD currents are biochemically downregulated um, by in, in essence, STEP winning the battle that I told you about before. So STEP is downregulating the function of NMDA channels and SARC is in fact, uh, as far as we can tell, virtually not on at all. So there's two aspects to the downregulation of NMDA channels the way we see it. One is the blockade by magnesium, which everybody knows about. And the other thing that you may not know about until you listen to this talk, 
which is that there's down regulation of NMDA uh, currents by this biochemical mechanism here. What we envisage happening after uh, or just around the time of tetanic stimulation or theta burst stimulation, these continu uh, conditioning stimuli that give rise to long-term potentiation is that there's a number of events that occur. One of them is the well-known relief of magnesium blockade. So there's no normal magnesium here. And then there's also biochemical activation of SARC through a number of different pathways that, which converge on SARC to activate SARC. Uh, and there's also downregulation of STEP. And another interesting phenomenon we think is going on, uh, which was discovered by Shen and Yu in my lab a number of years ago, is that the SARC phosphorylated version of the NMDA channel uh, complex is sensitive to intracellular sodium. So during tetanic and theta burst stimulation, these high frequency trains of stimuli, then we can see that sodium would go up as the, uh, the dendritic spines get loaded with sodium. So sodium would increase. And the, in essence, the NMDA channel gets a triple boost, one by relief of magnesium blockade, two by the SARC phosphorylation itself, and the third by this uh, potentiation by intracellular sodium. So though we, the way we see it then is that those three processes conspire to dramatically increase NMDA receptor function and dramatically drive calcium into the cell. And then there's a whole series of well-known and well-characterized biochemical steps that lead to either an increase in the number or the function of, of amphicurrent. So here's the idea that you're recruiting amphicurrents to the cell surface, amphichannels to the cell surface, and the idea that the function of amphichannels may increase as well. So this is how we see uh, uh, the biochemical and electrophysiological steps that go on to produce long-term potentiation in the hippocampus at the, well, at least this NMD receptor dependent form at Schaefer collateral CA1 synapses. Okay. So we've been investigating that for many years and a long time ago now, we started to work with Lynn May's lab because Lynn was interested in neuregulin signaling through uh, EGF receptor fam kinases and approached us with the, uh, the discovery he'd made that uh, one of these uh, EGF receptor family uh, kinases, in particular ERB4, he had found to be localized within the NMDA receptor complex. And we were interested, this was many years ago now, and we were interested in trying to find upstream regulators of SARC family kinases, either more kinases or phosphatases. And so we started to work with uh, Lynn's lab on understanding, uh, well, first determining whether ERB kinase, uh, ERB4 in particular, could regulate um, synaptic transmission or NMDA receptor function. And to make a very long story very short, what we found was that in hippocampal slices, again, when we recorded uh, field EPSPs, right? Now, not uh, whole cell recording, we recorded the, pop the population response. Uh, we used this peptide ligand, neuregulin 1 beta, to activate ERB4, a well-known activator. And when we applied the neuregulin 1 beta just before we gave, in this case, again, tetanic stimulation, what we found was that we could virtually entirely abrogate the induction of long-term potentiation which is shown down here, in slices that were treated with ERB4, or with neuregulin 1 to activate ERB4. So you can see that here in the population data as compared with control data. So we've been investigating that uh, for a long period of time now. So that was the basic phenomenology. Uh, at the same time, Lynn's lab had found, as I, I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, that ERB4 is a member of the NMDA receptor complex, and it's in the NMDA receptor complex by virtue of its C-terminal binding to one of the PDZ domains of uh, the major scaffold, which many of you will know, uh, the major scaffold in the NMDA receptor complex, PST95. So Lynn's lab had determined that, and as um, I said, this is what got us interested in the possibility that ERB4 might regulate NMDA receptor function and synaptic plasticity. So just a couple points about this. There is a bit of controversy in the field about where ERB4 is localized. So what we see is that ERB4 immunofluorescence decorates the uh, dendritic spines in the uh, CA1 pyramidal cells. So this is a CA1 pyramidal cell here. And you can see the dendrites here and this red immunofluorescence, these little dots are all along the dendrites of 
the C1 pyramidal cells. Uh, along with Richard Weinberg uh, and Lynn, then Richard looked in, uh, in this case, this was cortical neurons, but again at spiny synapses. And one can see using electron microscopy that ERB4 uh, immunogold labeling is there within dendritic spines. For example, here and here, and another example here of dendritic spine labeling of ERB4 uh, again in the cortex. So these large gold particles are uh, ERB4, and the small gold particles, which I hope you can see, for example, here, are actually PSV95 immunogold uh, labeling. So I think there's reasonable evidence then that at spiny synapses in the hippocampus and the cortex, there's ERB4 co-localizing with the other components of this uh, postsynaptic receptor complex. Okay. At the time that we were doing these experiments then, uh, we were interested from the perspective of synaptic plasticity and intervening receptor function. Uh, the genetics community had, uh, through a variety of studies, implicated the two proteins we were working on at the time, neuregulin 1, the agonist, and ERB4, the receptor, uh, as being major uh, determinants of uh, risk for schizophrenia. And so this is just meant to summarize a, a cartoon from uh, Lynn May's review from a number of years ago, describing some of the uh, allelic variants that are associated with schizophrenia. So there's now quite a bit of evidence implicating neuregulin 1 and ERB4 as major risk genes for schizophrenia. Since that, so that got us quite interested in, in the possibility that the work we've been doing on synaptic plasticity and function might be relevant to schizophrenia. Since then, there have been a number of different uh, studies that have further implicated the, uh, through work in humans, that this ERB4 neuregulin 1 signaling may contribute to uh, schizophrenia. So for example, Chung Gui Han's lab, together with Steve Arnold, uh, described a number of years ago now in this Nature of Innocent paper, using extra, uh, PSD extracts from schizophrenic brains and also from normal control brains, that there was NMDA receptor hypofunction in specifically in the uh, context of neuregulin 1 or B4 signaling. Coincidentally, along the way, then a number of uh, enzymes that are involved in regulating NMDA receptor function, some of which I told you about before, for example, PTP alpha, remember this is the phosphatase that dephosphorylates that C terminal 527 tyrosine when it's phosphorylated by CSK. So PTP alpha has been implicated in schizophrenia. And also this gene, PTPN5, which is the gene that encodes for STEP, uh, allelic variation also implicated as a risk for schizophrenia. So a number of lines of, you could think of as circumstantial but uh, evidence, but at least evidence that is consistent with the idea that NMDA receptor regulation by uh, a number of signaling pathways that converge on STEP and SARC may be involved in schizophrenia. So sort of buoyed by that, then we started to look a little bit further into this. And this is just to remind you again about this uh, fundamental observation that we made, which is that the regulin one has this very powerful effect of being able to first have absolutely no effect on basal synaptic transmission. This is a very important point. No effect on basal synaptic transmission but this dramatic ability to absolutely wipe out the uh, induction of long-term potentiation. So we've looked at that in a number of different ways. The first part was to actually get evidence that the uh, ERB4 signaling was involved in, the, in this effect of neuregulin. And we did that uh, with Graham Pitcher in my lab using uh, a couple of different approaches. One was using cardiac rescued ERB4 knockout mice. Er ERB4 deletion is embryonic lethal, but if there's cardiovascular rescue, then the animals are fine. And what uh, Graham found, uh, which is summarized in this histogram, is that in ERB4 null animals represented here, there's a couple different phenomena. First, that in those animals, the degree of potentiation, the basal long-term potentiation was actually greater than in control animals. But importantly, the effect of neuregulin one beta to decrease long-term potentiation, right, or to, uh, at least at the doses we used here, to produce this massive decrease in long-term potentiation. That was completely abrogated in mice lacking ERB4. Okay. So Graham could do that either in uh, ERB4 nulls or using one of a very uh, a number of different kinds of ERB kinase inhibitors. Now, of course, these inhibitors like PD, this PD compound, 
are not necessarily selective amongst the different family members. And so this is why we uh, combine the inhibitor with the uh, data from the ERB4 nulls to give us this idea that first there's ongoing regulation by ERB4 signaling, right? We can see that again here. If we block ERB, ERB signaling here, we get this enhancement of basal, or of what you might think of as basal LTP, and also that the ability of neuregulin 1 beta to inhibit long term potentiation is dependent upon ERB kinase. Okay. So, this is just some of the uh, population data again for that. And so, armed with that, then we started to think about a couple of things. In all those experiments that I just showed you, then, We've bath applied neuregulin 1 beta to the entire slice. We've started it just before, a few minutes before the condition and stimulus, which might be uh, tetanus or when what the rest of what I'm going to show you on this, we've always used theta burst stimulation. So when we do that and apply neuregulin 1 beta just before uh, the conditioning stimulus, then we can prevent the production of long term potentiation. Again, here, right here. But if we apply neuregulin 1 beta, after the potentiation has been developed for about 30 minutes or so, then we see no change here, no change in the amplitude of the synaptic uh, currents or EPSPs. In, in our interpretation of that is that neuregulin 1 beta is an ERB4 signaling are inhibiting the induction, but not the maintenance of long-term potentiation at these synapses. So it's during that induction time, you recall, that's when we think NMDA receptors are getting activated by that uh, triad of uh, biochemical and electrophysiological things that I mentioned before. So again, one important thing is that neuroangulin uh, has absolutely no effect on NMDA receptor function. Basal NMDA currents are completely resistant either to neuroangulin 1 beta or to the PDE compound. So it's not that um, when we use neuroangulin 1 beta, we're simply downregulating NMDA currents. We're not doing that at all at uh, Schaefer collateral CA1 synapses, but there must be something else going on to prevent the induction of long term potentiation. So, then to just bring you back to one of the other reagents that we use, remember I told you about this SARC phosphopeptide, SARC family kinase phosphopeptide activator. So, in the experiments Graham did here in hippocampal slices recording from CA1 neurons, he infused in the PYEI activating peptide and found that the amplitude of NM, the NMDA component of uh, synaptic currents got bigger and bigger and bigger. You can see that here. But in cells where he had pre-treated with neuregulin 1 beta, those ones here, then there was no increase. So neuregulin 1 beta pre-treatment was able to prevent the enhancement that we knew otherwise was mediated by SARC itself with the SARC family activator peptide. So essentially cutting off the ability of SARC family kinases to increase NMDA receptor function. And we can see that in a number of different ways. This is just, again, the formal proof that the, this ability to suppress the enhancement, I know this is a, a several double negatives. Um, so the ability of neuregulin 1 beta to suppress the enhancement by PYEI peptide, that's uh, prevented in animals that lack or before, and is also prevented by treatment with the, again, a different uh, ERB kinase inhibitor. So again, the idea is that this effect of neuregulin 1 beta, phenom this phenomenology of suppressing SARC enhancement of NMDA receptor currents is mediated by ERB4 receptors. So one aspect of this in terms of schizophrenia is that if uh, you're a schizophreniologist, then the place you're probably interested in most is not necessarily the hippocampus, but may well be the prefrontal cortex. So we asked Evelyn Lamb at the University of Toronto then to do recordings where she would uh, first determine whether NMDA currents in prefrontal cortex neurons are controlled by SARC family kinases the way we think they are in CA1 shaper, uh, CA1 synapses. And that you can see here. So infusing this PYEI peptide increased in the NMDA component of synaptic currents at Schaefer collateral synapses. And that neuregulin 1, just like in uh, CA1 synapses, Regulin 1 beta was completely able to prevent that uh, enhancement of uh, NMDA currents by, uh, by the PYEI peptide. So this phenomenology of preventing this potentiation is not limited to CA1 
uh, and to the hippocampus, but we also see evidence for that in prefrontal cortex as well. So one question you might ask is, remember I've been telling you that this PYE9 peptide then can activate SARC family kinases, not just SARC. Uh, so whether the, this phenomenology that I'm telling you about, about an irregular one beta, involves uh, SARC or another of the SARC family kinase members. So Graham, again in my lab, did experiments uh, using either wild type mice up here or, or uh, SARC null mice, so mice, mice lacking SARC that had been generated by Phil Soriano's lab many years ago now. And he found a couple things. First, he found that there was a slight but significant decrease in the amplitude of long-term potentiation in the SARC null mice, which you can see here, comparing way up here to the wild type mice. So that was one sort of predictable aspect. The other aspect is that in wild type mice, then you see this decrease in long-term potentiation produced by pretreatment with irregular one beta. But in the SARC null mice, even though there was some long-term potentiation, a residual LTP, this LTP was completely resistant to uh, the treatment with irregular one beta and also with inhibitors of uh, Irby kinases as well. So there was no enhancement of that. So the idea being that SARC then is necessary for this uh, neuregulin one beta signaling. Not only is it necessary, but the effect occurs very early in the, th uh, in the conditioning transfer. So this is just an example of average recordings of the very first of the theta burst trains. So we used uh, theta burst, which is four pulses uh, at 100 hertz, separated by uh, 100 milliseconds. And what you see then is this is, a res this is the response to a single action potential or a single stimulus, a single input. And then these progressive responses going all the way up to here are the responses to this four set of four bursts. So this is the depolarizing envelope. Now we're recording not in voltage clamp here, but in current clamp. So we see this is a membrane potential depolarization produced in response to either a single or the burst. And a there's a couple things. One is that neuregulin one beta has absolutely no effect on the response to the single. So although you can't see it, there's a black trace, which is right underneath the green trace here. But what you can see, I think quite dramatically and clearly, is that the neuregulin one beta effect is on the depolarization that occurs as a result of the burst. So you can see this dramatic difference here between control slices untreated with neuregulin one beta and slices that have been treated with neuregulin one beta here. So we think that the ability of uh, neuregulin one beta or before signaling can occur very early in the process of long-term potentiation and reduction, maybe just with a couple or three or four um, inputs. Okay. So this is the model that Graham and I came up with a, a number of years ago to sort of put all this together. You recall now that I've told you a few times this idea about tonic regulation uh, and downregulation of NAD currents uh, in basal synaptic transmission, that this biochemical pathway that uh, isn't shown in any detail here other than to mention the, again this idea that ERB4 signaling is causing a, a basal or ongoing uh, su partial suppression of long-term potentiation and reduction. Enhancing neuregulin ERB4 signaling then can essentially shut off or dramatically suppress synaptic plasticity, in this case long-term potentiation. Conversely, in what may be going on in some ex hyperexcitability situations, for example like chronic pain or perhaps epilepsy, is that there's enhanced synaptic plasticity. So moving neuregulin one or before signaling either up or down then can have this effect to either suppress when neuregulin one signaling goes up, neuregulin one or before signaling goes up, or to inhibit or, or further enhance synaptic plasticity when or before neuregulin one signaling goes down. So this idea of plasticity of plasticity, I'm gonna talk in the last few minutes about a little bit more about metaplasticity but this idea of uh, signaling in this way. Okay, so this is our model. The reason that we, so the idea in terms of schizophrenia, then as I told you a couple times now, there's no effect of neuregulin one or before signaling on basal, basal AMPA mediated synaptic transmission or on basal um, uh, signaling through NMDA receptors with single inputs. So the, I, the idea that's out there is that schizophrenia may be a hypofunction of NMDA receptor signaling. 
our take on this is that, that it may not be hypofunction of NMDA receptors per se, but it's loss of uh, SARC mediated enhancement. So hypoplasticity or hypofunction of NMDA receptors in the context where they're upregulated by uh, synaptic transmission. So in the last couple minutes then, I'm just gonna uh, tell you very briefly and go through quite quickly this idea that we've been working on together with John McDonald's lab, which sort of builds from the idea that we got through or before signaling uh, about metaplasticity. So the idea that plasticity can is actually uh, switchable or uh, the gain of the plasticity can be changed. So this is just to remind you about this idea that we've had now about SARC family kinases uh, at the center of regulation of NMDA currents and uh, many different signaling pathways have been implicated in regulating the function of SARC family kinases in this context. Some of those are G-protein coupled receptors which are shown down here and John McDonald's lab has done a lot of work on this and I'm going to make a, a go through these last few slides quite quickly. So the idea with these is that um, there's a subunit specificity. So I ask you to remember way back to one of the first slides that I showed you a while ago to, re to remember that NMDA uh, subunits, the glutamate binding subunits come in four different flavors. These are the gluin 2s. So it's gluin 2A, 2B or 2C or 2D. The predominant ones in the mammalian CMS are gluin 2A and 2B. And what John's lab had found uh, that activating SARC then has a preferential effect of enhancing the function of gluin 2A containing receptors. And this can be done either with recombinant SARC or by uh, stimulating G-protein coupled receptor pathways such as the PAC1 receptor uh, that preferentially activates SARC itself. Conversely and differentially, there's enhancement of NMDA currents, but preferentially of the gluin 2B subtype when the SARC family kinase member FIN is activated. So FIN enhances NMDA gluin 2B mediated currents and receptor function, whereas SARC seems to preferentially enhance gluin 2A containing NMDA receptors. So that's important for this idea about frequency dependence of synaptic uh, plasticity. So some of you are probably familiar with this kind of a graph where at, at high frequencies like 100 hertz or 100 hertz uh, TBS, synapses, particularly CA1 shaped collateral synapses, potentiate here, whereas at lower frequencies of stimuli, then the, the predominant change in uh, with those stimuli patterns and frequencies is to depress. So the idea is that, uh, or has been proposed, that, the, the sh that this plasticity frequency response curve is shiftable and shiftable on the basis of the relative contribution of gluin 2A or gluin 2B subunit. So given that this idea that SARC family kinase, SARC can enhance a gluin 2A containing subunits, then what John's lab found was that this frequency response was shifted to the left. So stimuli that in particular would, in frequencies that would produce suppression or long-term depression caused in fact excitation. Whereas activating the FIN pathway shifted this frequency response the other way. So that in particular here, you can see that stimuli that produce depression at this frequency then had no effect or here frequencies that had no effect actually caused potentiation uh, or depression, sorry, this is the other way around. Okay, so then John's lab was able to take advantage of uh, work done mostly by Tadashi Yamamoto's lab that had implicated a number of different phosphorylation sites uh, in this C termini of gluin 2A and 2B receptors as being important in uh, the effects of SARC or FIN on those receptors. And what John's lab found was that the SARC potentiation of gluin 2A or gluin 2A mediated currents was completely blocked in mutant mice, knock-in mice, where this tyrosine here had been replaced by phenylalanine, preventing phosphorylation. And conversely, this site in gluin 2B, uh, where at 1427, when this tyrosine is replaced by phenylalanine, then the effect of activating FIN is completely blocked. This is in terms of uh, the responses to exogenous NMDA 
the responses to uh, synoptically released uh, glutamate in terms of the synoptically released EPSPs, the NMDA component of EPSPs. And so the idea is that over that this frequency response curve can be shifted. So there's metaplasticity that's not only based upon the receptor subunit, whether it's 2A or 2B, but also upon these regulatory events by Sark family kinases. So that for thin, in terms of its ability to enhance gluin 2B, promotes long-term depression. Whereas Sark, by its ability to phosphorylate gluin 2A, promotes long-term potentiation. And so this is the basic model that we've been using because we think that a number of disease entities may be related to alterations in metaplasticity. So we're starting to investigate that now. So I'm gonna end there and just remind you that we have this idea that uh, SARC family kinases, in particular SARC and FIN, are important regulators of NMDA receptor function and that these uh, kinases themselves can be regulated by a number of different signaling pathways and in particular, the ones that I've talked about are ERB4 signaling and also signaling through G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, and now I think, uh, let me just end by um, just showing a list of the many people who have been involved from my lab here in Toronto and also from the labs of many of our collaborators uh, in Toronto and also in, um, in the United States. So I'm gonna switch over and I need to use my glasses now to read some of the questions. Okay. So, okay. So I think uh, somebody was asking me about, uh, I'm going to just go back to this slide because I think that will be um, a little bit easier. So one of the questions is, uh, does SARC modulate AMPA receptors directly? So Rick Huguenard's lab does have some evidence that SARC family kinase may Sark family kinases may modulate AMPA receptor function. In our hands, and I think in a, a number of people's hands, in John McDonald and a number of other people, um, what we see is that NMDA receptors uh, are preferentially activated, and we don't find any evidence for direct effects of Sark family kinases on AMPA receptors. Uh, okay, let me just see. Uh, someone was asking about Sark, so hopefully we've been able to explain what. Uh, SARC is, is, so SARC was the first uh, oncogene uh, that was uh, identified as the uh, kinase that mediated the effect of the Rouse sarcoma virus. So this is where SARC got its name. I think that's maybe what somebody was asking. Um, and somebody else is asking, are the presynaptic mechanisms relevant to NMDA receptor mediated LTB? So this has been a big bone of contention, I think, in the, in the field. Um, I think the preponderance of evidence has really coalesced on that this er what you may think of as early LTB is primarily mediated by postsynaptic mechanisms, uh, as I described through changes in uh, first NMDA receptor function, and then ultimately in either the function or number of AMPA receptors at the cell surface. So either an increase in number or an increase in the function of AMPA receptors as the primary mechanism. Uh, there may be then with, for example, with late long-term potentiation, also rearrangements of the synapse and um, some presynaptic actions. But this for, uh, form of LTP that we're talking about, I think is primarily mediated by postsynaptic mechanisms. Okay, I'm looking to see. Um, okay, I think that is the last question. So I am going to put up, for those of you that are eligible for CME credits, uh, this is the link where you can get uh, your CME credits. And I thank all of you uh, for listening. <laughs>